Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado... Here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 243 with Sherry Walling. Sherry is the life force behind Zen Founder. She's a licensed clinical psychologist with extensive experience treating stress-related problems in high-achieving people. She's an academic and professional powerhouse with master's degrees in psychology and theology, formal training as a yoga teacher, and a PhD in clinical psychology. She has extensive experience treating PTSD in combat veterans, working with families trapped in family violence, and supporting the mental health needs of physicians and police officers. She's also one of the early professionals to creatively combine yoga and psychotherapy. Already an accomplished professional, Sherry began working with entrepreneurs when her husband, Rob Wilding, launched his first startup more than 10 years ago. Being a life partner in an entrepreneurial family, she has lived the frenetic pace of a tech startup. Pairing her professional training and personal experience, she's helped countless founders and their families work through burnout, conflict, transition stress, and crisis. Sherry is the author of the newly released book, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together, How to Run Your Business Without Letting It Run You. Seth Godin says this book is a personal, generous, and incredibly useful guide to staying sane and changing the world at the same time, and demands that you should read it before you think you need to. Sherry also hosts the Zen Founder podcast, which is over 160 episodes strong explored so many topics in this conversation. Expect to learn more about the stresses of entrepreneurship and whether the crush it mentality really serves anyone, what the optimum amount of hours to work is, how much sleep you should be getting, how to manage relationships with a significant other while building your business, tools and techniques you can use to bring you more clarity and control, the power of self-awareness and understanding your strengths, and a hell of a lot more. So with that, let's get stuck into today's conversation with Sherry Welling. Welcome to the show, Sherry. Hey, it is my pleasure. I'm glad we got to talk today. Uh, so am I, and you're joining me all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Did I get that the right way around? <laughs> you did, and it's confusing because they're both really long words to start with M. Um, yeah, but it's right in the middle of the country in the sort of northern tip on the border between uh, the U.S. and Canada. So Yeah, and is it true that... People from Minnesota have a little bit of a Canadian twang to the way you say certain words, or is that not so true? There is definitely a Minnesota accent, uh-huh. um, but you won't hear it from me because I'm a Californian who's uh, been transplanted here. So yes. people think that I speak strangely uh, because I have a little bit of a, of a California accent going on. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, uh, Minneapolis is the home of the famous prince as well. Indeed, yes. And there is there is deep love for Prince here. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. So, Sherry, it's great to have you on the show. Um, many of our audience members will know you as the host of Zen Founder Podcast, which um, anybody looking to find out more about how to just manage um, the emotional baggage that comes with entrepreneurship, really head out, listen to that show, subscribe, like, share, do all that good stuff. But today I wanted to explore um, your work. Um, and you know you've been pairing your psychological expertise with decades of entrepreneurial experience for a while now. Um, and you know there's a lot of self-help books out there and, and whatnot. But I feel like oftentimes 
when it comes to this topic, they fail to take into account the nuances of entrepreneurship, which can be a fairly different proposition to what um, you might find in other walks of life. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that there are some specific values that go into entrepreneurship that make it a little bit emotionally and psychologically different than other walks of life. And, and maybe one of the most significant pieces of that is that people who become entrepreneurs are pretty closely integrated with their businesses. Like mm -hmm. there's some shared identity. There's a pretty deep connection. And so to say to someone – Oh, just take a break from your work. I mean, sometimes that's the right thing to say. So, and I say it myself sometimes. Yeah. But I think it doesn't fully capture um, the depth of connection that there is between you and the thing that you've built. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. I mean, that identity that we tend to derive or that self-worth that an entrepreneur tends to derive from their investment in their business, it can really amount to – a big part of their, their life and the way they see themselves to the point where if that business happens to fail, it can have this sort of domino effect in terms of other aspects of their lives rather than just, oh, I got fired from this job or I'm, I'm an employee, I can just go off and get another job. It's quite, quite different in terms of that enduring effect. Yeah, and I think it can really feel like a failure of yourself, mm. which is huge. It's it's not as simple as you say as just just going and getting another job or, you know, I'll take two weeks off, lay on the couch, sort of be depressed and then pick myself up and do interviews. I mean, that's when you spend um years building something and it doesn't work out and everything that you've poured into it are your best ideas and your best energy and hours and hours of your time. It's a pretty deep injury. I mean, it's a really significant loss to people in their lives. So how might entrepreneurs go about, I mean, to me, it sounds like having some sort of delineation between your identity and your business uh, would be a healthy thing. So how might entrepreneurs go about navigating that delicate balance, particularly when you invest so much time and energy into growing your business? Yeah, I think one of the ways that I like to talk about this is just the simple statement, like you need to diversify your holdings. Yeah. Like you can't put all of your investment energy into one part of your life. You still need to have friends. You need to cultivate relationships. It's great to have a hobby. It's great to keep your body healthy. I mean, you, you can't put everything into one, you know, into one activity. That's, it's just not wise investment, you yeah. know? Yeah, and this this goes back to uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Not being um, centric in any one domain of your life, you know, not being just all about your spouse, not being all about um, working out, not being all about your business, um, and just living a principle-centered life, or as you've put it, having a portfolio of things that you invest your time in, so you derive your identity from, hey, I go to the gym, I'm healthy, I'm fit, I'm into my business, I invest in my family, I take my kids to soccer practice, whatever it is, so that if one of those things should happen to, say, um, subside or not be such a big part of your life anymore, that it doesn't completely crush you. Absolutely. It's about having more than one thing that you love and that you care about. Mm. So, so what's – sorry, you are about to say? I was just going to say I think for founders too, it's super important to be in relationship with other founders because – um, the more folks that you know that are trying to do this startup world, the more people that you will know who have failed and kind of come out the other side. Mm. And I think that's also that's also really helpful for people to have some sort of firsthand experience of or at least know people who they've seen struggle for something. It doesn't work out. And then you see, OK, there's life after that. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think with uh, support networks or you know, the old adage that you are the sum of the five people you spend your most time with. I think today, to me, it seems as if a lot of up and coming entrepreneurs may be at risk of, say, spending a lot of time with certain personalities online, um, in their heads, you know, podcasts and whatnot. And there's a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are like, you know, you've got to crush it. You've got to work 16 hours a day. This is your time. Um, you know, your friends are out there having fun. That's their loss. You know, that whole attitude of just go, go, go. I mean, what's your view on that? I have a problem with it, to be honest. Mm. I mean, I have no problem with working hard um, and, and doubling down on the things that are important to you. But 
but we really misunderstand how our brains function when we think that more work is better work. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between quantity of work and quality of work. And most people just cannot sustain any kind of meaningful function from, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. And the more that we sacrifice things like sleep and exercise and reasonable nutrition and relationships, those those the loss of those things shortens our lives. I mean, it's it's not a trivial sacrifice to say just, you know, just crush it, just hustle, just do more, more, more. You don't need to sleep. You don't need to hang out with your people. Your friends are out having fun. Who cares about them? Yeah. Go, go, go. Yeah. Do it. And that's, it's really a short-sighted trading of what is actually going to make your entrepreneurial journey sustainable and successful over the long run yeah. versus this sort of adrenaline fueled hyper kind of message that I think sells, but isn't necessarily wise. Could not agree more. And a couple of things you've touched on there was uh, sleep and just not and, and quality versus quantity. So you're a clinical psych psychologist by trade. So when it comes to um, quantity versus quality, I mean, is there like an optimum point of time after which we have that diminishing um, rate of, or marginal returns after a while? I mean, for me, I find after say six hours of really deep work, so turning off notifications, um, getting rid of distractions and just focusing, um, even six hours, like you need to have breaks within that six hours. But after that, I find the quality of work diminishes and I'm, I'll tend to just then switch gears and focus on process-oriented stuff that doesn't really require critical thinking. Yeah, I think that's a good number. I mean, six hours is really quite a lot for sustained focus. Mm. Um, but if you've got some good breaks in there and maybe maybe yeah. a lunch break and a walk around the block or at least moving your body a few times yeah. in the midst of that, then that's a pretty solid work day. I would say it's probably more like four to five for most people to be mm. able to sustain the, that focused attention. And then, you know, you spend the rest of your time sort of futzing around online or checking email or working on social media stuff. And And that can be important depending on what your business is. But yeah, our brains just don't do great work for much longer than that, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, I'm in the process of writing a book right now, and I know you've published uh, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. Um, what was your writing process like when it came to that sustained focus and, you know, uh, as Cal Newport says, deep work? Yeah, I worked in about, like, I guess probably two and a half hour chunks three days a week. So I had sort of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday rhythm. And mm -hmm. I found that worked for me because I kind of needed a day break in between to give myself a little bit of space. Yeah. But I found that two and a half hours of kind of deep immersion was really all I could sustain. And that was enough to really push forward on a chapter. So I mm -hmm. tried to do about a chapter a week. It didn't always work out that well. Um, but that that felt like it was generally enough time with, with those longer breaks in between. Yeah. And um the quality of work you would have um, produced during that 2.5 hours would have arguably been much better than, say, seven hours at a surface level where you've got lots of distractions, you're like switching between lots of different tasks. And I feel like that's how so many people still show up to work today, whether they're entrepreneurs or whether they're working for a large organization. And I think a lot of us feel like we have to, but I, you know that's that's obviously not true. And you're you're familiar with Cal Newport's book Deep Work, and I think that's been a really profound book um, for me and for a lot of people who have read it because it presents the the evidence so clearly that working in that frenetic, distracted way is really very counterproductive mm. and really quite bad for our brains. Yeah, and speaking of being bad for our brains, I mean, we talked about we mentioned sleep briefly a moment ago. I mean, what are some of the cognitive effects of, say, getting four to five hours sleep for a you know, six-month period of time as opposed to seven-plus hours? Oh, it's a mess. It's terrible for mood regulation. So we see increased levels of depression, anxiety, lots of irritability, fractured relationships. Um, your immune system starts to suffer, and then you might also experience like your, your body is kind of um, – not metabolizing food well, so you're gaining weight, um, you know, your skin breaks out, your complexion doesn't look great. I mean, it's sort of like 
all of these different domains of our body are not functioning well. Sleep is also the time in which we integrate new memories into our brain. Our brain is sort of very actively practicing new information that's been, that it's encountered in a day. Mm -hmm. And when we don't give it that space to do that mental exercise, that, that sort of cognitive neurological work, then our, you know, our memory, our capacity for focus is significantly decreased. So it's sort of like every metric of functioning, think about it emotionally, cognitively, relationally, and physically, all of those parts of us are pretty deeply affected by prolonged lack of sleep. Yeah, uh, and it comes back to that whole quality versus quantity thing. And I know Ben Horowitz um, from Andreas and Horowitz, the venture capital firm, he says that the number one trait um, that he has developed as an entrepreneur was managing his psychology. Um, because if he shows up to work and he's down and he infects the rest of the team with his negativity and he is irritable, he makes bad decisions, um, that effectively is like a really shaky foundation on which you build a house. And if you're not getting enough sleep, then arguably over time you will be struggling to manage that psychology. Absolutely. Um, so I guess on um, – Entrepreneurship, you know, it can be quite a lonely road, uh, particularly if your family, your friends, your spouse, your partner aren't entrepreneurs, they've never been entrepreneurs, they don't know what it's like. Um, in that situation, I mean, how do entrepreneurs best navigate that loneliness? I mean, is it a matter of just reaching out, like you said, to other entrepreneurs in their community, you know, through meetup.com or something like that and starting to build a support network? I mean, what else can they be doing? You know, I really think it's helpful to have different different spheres of relationships. So yeah, it's essential to be in relationship or be connected to other entrepreneurs. And whether that's meetups or conferences or masterminds that you do online, there are there are lots of mechanisms for that if you if you really look hard. Uh, maybe not even hard. They're they're out there. You just have to look. Yeah. But I I do think it is important to continue to have pretty deep connections with folks that aren't entrepreneurs, and they might not totally get what you do, but I think every human understands what it's like to want something and work hard for something or be disappointed or, um, you know, have a bad day. And I think it really is on us to figure out how to translate our lives in a way that other people understand. And um, again, that they don't they don't necessarily need to totally understand the ins and outs of your job, but it, it is or your business, but it is helpful for you to be able to still interact with folks who don't live in that startup tech world and, you know, be liked for other things like, you know, how you are at quiz night at the pub and your bowling skills and things like that. Yeah. And I think that just comes back to diversifying your community um, because if you are completely surrounded by other run and gun entrepreneurs, it comes back to what we were saying earlier, that your identity will just be so wrapped up into that world that if your business didn't work out, it would just crush you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on um, the – in your book, you talk about um, knowing yourself and knowing where you came from and how that's crucial to your success. What exactly do you mean? Well, I – you know, this is part of my psychology training is to understand someone over the course of their development. And I think it's super important, mm -hmm. especially for entrepreneurs, to really have a sense of how their childhood experience fits into what they're doing now. Yeah. And that can mean that we're trying to outrun something or it can mean we're trying to prove something to that father who was difficult to prove you know, to, to sort of get acknowledgement from, I guess. And it can mean that you are – you see yourself as sort of this golden child who's been very successful at everything so far. And so therefore you continue to be successful. There's not, there's certainly not one story. And yeah. as I've interviewed entrepreneurs and talked to entrepreneurs over the years, there really isn't one kind of background that people come from. There's not one route that we take, of course, but understanding what are the psychological forces at play within us is really important and powerful when we start to feel stressed or we start to feel compulsively competitive with this one specific person because maybe deep down in us, they remind us of the like sort of high school jock that bullied us or they remind us of um, the boyfriend that left us or something. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, we're talking about building more self-awareness around why we behave um, in certain ways and oftentimes – that behavior could hark back to childhood experiences, um, 
if you're in a, a relationship, I guess a classic case is somebody who was perhaps not given the freedom they wanted as a child by their parents will find it then much harder to settle down as an adult. They'll, f- I think there's a term for it called enmeshment. Um, mm-hmm. But then becoming conscious as to why you make certain decisions and how oftentimes it's not completely deliberate, as in it's not free will as, as such, it is something much deeper inside you. But if you become conscious of that, then you can notice it in the moment as to why you're making that decision and arguably change p- paths to something that may be more conducive to a better outcome. Yeah, well said. Well said. <laughs> I, I do think that you know our motivations are complicated um, mm-hmm. and human beings are pretty complicated. And the ways that we've been hurt in the past or the things that we've loved in the past still do continue to kind of have its traces into our present and our future. And so – Knowing yourself and being self-reflective is like a lifelong endeavor. None of us arrive because just when we think we've got it figured out, we change and we shift and we, you know, learn new things or something in our lives changes. So I think when I talk about, you know, knowing yourself or the importance of of being self-reflective, it really is about being curious about our own motivations and acknowledging that there are things that we might not always have easy access to, but that shape our behavior and how we see the world. Mm-hmm. No, that's beautiful. And um, on relationships, I mean, I kind of t- touched on enmeshment there and we've talked about building that support network. But what about the relationship you might have with your partner or your spouse, especially if they have no idea what your world is about? I mean, you kind of touched on having that uh, open dialogue with them, trying to communicate in a way that they can understand, but it's still not an easy road. I mean, you could be building a business over the course of three, four, five years, maybe during that time you've got peaks and troughs in terms of income, which can cause a strain on the relationship. Um, I mean, this is a topic that you've currently, we are currently exploring at depth. So what can you share in that space that can help entrepreneurs better navigate those types of relationships? Yeah, I think those can be very hard relationships. The ups and downs of the entrepreneurial journey are pretty hard on those around you. Mm. I mean, interestingly, one of the things that we are sort of learning about how the brain works is that emotion is pretty contagious. We feel with the people in our house and we feel with the people in our office and the people that we spend time with. So if you are anxious and up and down and worried and stressed and all over the place, so is your significant other. So are your family members. They catch that from you, so to speak. So I'm a... Yeah, I mean, I'm a clinical psychologist, I, and I'm married to a serial software founder. So we come from totally different backgrounds and different disciplines. Um, but some of the things that have been helpful for us over the past is finding little ways to partner. So when Rob, my husband, is upset and is tempted to send, like, an angry email, he always sends it to me first. So I'm his, like anger filter, (laughs) like how many swear words can you use in one email? (laughs) And I sort of help him process that. And, you know, he does a lot of proofreading for me and helps me uh, program my dissertation. And, And so even though we come from very different domains, we're always looking for a common ground and ways that we can support each other. Yeah. So some of the tricks in relationships are figuring out how to ask for support well and ask for the right kind of support at the right time. Um, and also assuming, I think, some responsibility for insulating your family or your significant other from the ups and downs. So for us, that looked like us finding a very conservative financial number that Rob needed to make in his entrepreneurial life. And that was the number that went to our family. And it was pretty, you know, it was pretty simple. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a huge fancy number. Mm-hmm. But That always came into our bank account and everything else went to his business. And sometimes that was a big number and sometimes it was a small number, but I didn't always know about it because I didn't want to and I couldn't do anything about it. So deciding how you're going to partner, how involved is your significant other going to be? What do you need from them? How can you ask that clearly? What do they need from you? Yeah, it's really just about open communication and being clear about the terms of engagement. (laughs) It is, but I think it's a little bit harder than it sounds because many of us just get in the day-to-day of our lives and we forget to think about the big picture of like, how am I supporting your dreams right now? Mm -hmm. It's more like most of my thoughts are like, why didn't you make the bed? Can you take the kids to school? You know, it's, it's these sort of rote parts of life rather than 
the uh, the bigger pieces. Mm. So. And, and on um, something you mentioned there around you know negativity being contagious, if you bring that home, it can affect the rest of the family. And um, I spoke with uh, Ben Greenfield, who was voted one of America's number one personal trainers, and he hosts a podcast um, called Ben Greenfield Fitness. And he was saying that. You know, he's got so much going on in his life, but when he gets home, just before he walks through that door, he'll take six deep breaths um, to change his mental state because he knows once he get, gets in, there'll be Disney soundtracks blaring, there'll be kids shooting him with Nerf guns, his wife's trying to prepare dinner, there's all this chaos, um, and if he's got any sort of baggage, um, he doesn't want to bring that home and you know tell his kids to shut up or anything like that once they come shooting him with the guns. So being conscious and and I suppose doing what you can to change that mental state ahead of time. Yeah, transitions are super important and figuring out how to transition well is really a skill, I think, for lots of entrepreneurs, especially people who are doing startups where they're they're working from their own home. And mm-hmm. so they don't even have kind of the benefit of like going to a different place yeah. and then coming back home. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that situation, it's important to sort of have this carved out workspace. So you have, you do have an office. It just might be this very small closet in your house or, yeah. or wherever it might be. And there's a, a show that I grew up on it here in the States. And I don't know if it uh, was in Australia or other parts of the world, but Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So this guy named Mr. Rogers, like, you know, he – the show opens with him coming home and he takes off his loafers and he takes off his suit jacket and he puts on his slippers and he puts on his sweater. And it's like this perfect transition of what it means to go from work to home. And I think whether that's six breaths or you walk in your door and then you just go to the back of the house and put on your shorts and your ratty t-shirt or whether you have some other ritual where you park your car and you walk around the block before you go in the house, those things are really helpful, I think, in terms of transitioning our mind from one focus to another focus. Yeah, I think – I mean I can't sort of understand that a little bit more in terms of these rituals that people have and the connection with the brain. I mean for example, before I get to bed every night, I mean I'll stop looking at my phone about an hour before bed. I'll – I keep a gratitude journal. I'll read one page from uh, Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius's meditations. It's just this routine, right? But I feel like when I do that because – I do this every night before I go to bed. I feel like I'm sending a signal to my brain saying, okay, guy, okay, brain, time to shut down for six, seven mm-hmm. hours. Um, so is there a direct connection between those rituals and the way the brain interprets it and behaves? There is, <laughs> I, and those are context cues. I mean, our brains are working really hard to take in information from our environment, not just the thoughts that we think cognitively, but everything that's happening around us. Mm -hmm. And so when we give our brain context cues, when we give our brain spaces and colors and sounds and smells and sensory information that cues it to what it's supposed to be thinking about or doing next, um, you know, that's a great way to have this sort of whole person, wholly integrated shift, whether it's from wake to sleep or from work to home or from, you know, focus to play. All of those, all of those uh, things that we build around us to help our brain transition are really helpful. Mm. And um, I guess the same would apply when making your way to the office as well. Like that transition from home to work. Um, you know, if you're about to give a keynote, what are the different sort of mechanisms you can rely on, like visualization or six deep breaths, or there's different things for different people. The way they choose to frame that event will then influence or directly impact their performance in the moment. Right. A Spotify playlist. Yeah. A series of things that you tell yourself. Yeah. 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 I, I particularly like Brain FM. If I'm writing, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Brain FM, but it's like... I'm bi- not. So Brain.FM, basically binaural beats, which, um, and I'm not uh, an expert on the matter, but supposedly they're supposed to help you get into flow. Um, so you're just working in that deep work state rather than... If I was to listen to, say... One of my favorite bands, Iron Maiden. Yes, I'm showing my age here. But if I was to listen to a heavy metal band with the lyrics and, and the music and everything else, it's much harder to get into flow than it is to just listen to this repetitive sort of beat and, and you know ambient sound and whatnot. Yeah, I similarly, there's a deep focus playlist on Spotify uh-huh. or genre, I should say, on Spotify that is my kind of go-to. And yes, it's it's kind of beats, it's rhythmic, there's no lyrics, 
but it's it's like upbeat enough that it kind of like probably matches or accelerates your heart rate a little bit. Like uh-huh. it, it definitely has some energy. It has some flow. It's not relaxed meditative piano, which is lovely, but will totally put me to sleep or make me yeah. like want to have a glass of wine, not yeah. focus and work. <laughs> Love it. So, I mean, we've talked about a, a few tools organically in this conversation, such as, you know, deep breathing, um, beats, you know, journaling. I guess, what are some other tools that entrepreneurs can use to kind of um, stay grounded and not let irritability or anxiety take over? And we've touched on it a little bit, and I'm sure it's familiar to your audience, but um, in addition to sleep, um, nutrition and exercise are Mm. just huge foundational considerations for not just, you know, staying fit or whatever, but really optimizing mental performance. Um, so if you have a regular exercise routine and that doesn't even have to be, you don't have to do CrossFit. Like you don't have to be a surfer. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but you do need to move your body for 30 minutes at least three times a week. That's sort of the baseline. Mm -hmm. You must do that in order to kind of function well mentally. Um, and then also, of course, thinking about how you fuel your body. And I think I think in the next 10 years, we'll begin to see increasing research that connects our brain and gut function. It, it's already existing, you know, that we look at some of the causes of, of things like depression and anxiety. Yes, it's serotonin. Yes, it's neurotransmitters. But I think it's also we're going to increasingly see that it has to do with bacteria in our guts and immune function. And all of that is, of course, very integrated into the the kinds of food that we eat and the way that we take care of how many chemicals and, you know, just sort of complicated things are in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Gut health is becoming a a bigger topic um, I'm finding amongst entrepreneurial circles, health circles, mental health circles. And it's funny when people ask the question, what kind of exercises can I do for my brain? The same kind of exercises you do for your body, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> Move your body, eat well, sleep enough. <laughs> what's, what's your um, sort of go-to um, breakfast, Sherry? Um, well, you know, I'm a big fan of avocado toast. Uh-huh. <laughs> my my uh, family makes fun of me. They're like, that's a real millennial food. And I'm like, I don't care. I love it. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I keep it very simple in terms of I'm not dogmatic about what I eat. I'm not vegan. I, you know, I have, I, I like Michael Pollan's philosophy, which is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Yeah. So whole yeah. wheat bread with a little avocado sprinkled with a little sea salt. And I'm like happy for, you know, yeah. for four hours. That's Love a that. good fuel for my morning. And you're right. It's definitely a millennial food and it's a huge food of choice here in Melbourne. Um, I was actually in Bali recently with a group of eight guys for a bucks party or a bachelor party. Yeah. And went out to breakfast one morning of the eight people. Guess how many ordered the avocado toast? Oh, eight, I hope. Oh, seven. Seven. One guy oh. just had to break the script. It was seven in a row, then the last guy's like, mm, I feel like I need to just get the eggs Benedict here just so I can be different. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> um, so I briefly touched on the book earlier, Sherry. I mean, what else can entrepreneurs um, learn by picking up your book? Oh, dear. Um you know, I think what we've attempted to do in the book, and, and the, the co-author is my husband, Rob, we've we've tried to be pretty forthcoming and honest about some of the ups and downs that we've experienced both as a family and, um, you know, alongside the founders that we are close to, and give a pretty realistic picture of both the hard parts, um, dealing with haters, dealing with criticism, dealing with failure, Dealing with when your life is overwhelming. We had a year last year where multiple family members battled cancer and multiple family members were in the ICU and, you know, we ended up taking emergency custody of some kids. Like it was just a crazy year. But yet our businesses got done and our work got done. Um, And I think we don't always account for the kind of personal chaos that can shape our work. Mm. And so we've attempted to kind of give both some preventative, like have these things in place, knowing that at some point life's going to get tricky and complicated and you want to be ready. And that's actually, you know, as an aside, kind of going back to how we began our conversation, that's a great reason to not think that you can function at all cylinders all the time. You need to leave like a little bit of margin for the fact that life happens, that people get sick, that hurricanes and tornadoes are a reality, you know, that you need a little bit of space in your life 
to, you know, handle the ups and downs that are unforeseen and come from other sources. Yeah. And I feel like certain types of personalities struggle with that margin. Um, like certain types of personalities may have very high expectations of themselves and therefore when they don't achieve or when they aren't able to bring um, 100% or whatever it is to the table, they feel like a bit of a disappointment or a bit of a failure. Um, so I know you've explored this topic of A-type personalities versus B-type personalities. Keen to understand more around what types of personalities perhaps best lend themselves to entrepreneurship, but then personalities that don't, how might they go about managing some of their, shall we say, shortcomings when it comes to the realm of uh, building a business? Yeah, I I am not convinced that there's an optimal personality type for mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. I mean, certainly, you know, someone who is dedicated and passionate and organized, there are yeah. certainly skills that go into it. But people of different risk tolerance, people of different energy level, people of different, um, to use this sort of technical personality to neuroticism. So when we talk about being type A and sort of the rigidity with which life needs to happen, yeah. that that's neurotic. Um, and not in the bad name calling way. That's just the, the historical <laughs> term for that trait. Um, but certainly too much neuroticism and you don't have enough creativity. You can't think outside the box. You can't problem solve very well. Mm -hmm. But if you're way too far outside the box and just live in that creative space, then it can be real hard for you to get things done. So we talk about this a little bit in the book. And, you know, and really we come down to the slightly irritating, there's no right answer. And it's, it's a... a a function of knowing what your strengths are and then also having a mechanism to compensate for the things that are not your particular strengths. So if you're a, a very organized kind of type A neurotic operator, then you probably need to have someone on your team or someone in your life who can, you know, help you celebrate, help you play, help you figure out how to be creative or play outside the box a little bit. Yeah. So you don't have to be everything and you can't be good at everything. Knowing your strengths is, of course, the first step, but then making a plan for how to fill out any relative gaps is helpful too. Yeah, and um, that aligns with a book called um, – or some of the teachings of a book called Strengths-Based Leadership, um, mm -hmm. which is all about optimizing and capitalizing on your strengths, but rather than trying to – bring your weaknesses up to everybody else's sort of level of normality. Um, just getting someone else to do that stuff. Like, and this comes back to what we said earlier about knowing yourself. If I know what my strengths are, um, I can then capitalize on that stuff, but I need to understand what my weaknesses are. And if it doesn't make sense for me to address them, then find someone else to do that stuff. Um, and in terms of doing that, one thing we did in the team here was to basically send out surveys well, not necessarily, well, I guess surveys to every other team member. What are my strengths? What do you think my strengths are? And then just see what came up more often. And then use that to kind of guide how you spend your time and, and not focus on other things. So what might founders do to become, other than what I've just proposed, become more uh, aware of their own strengths? Because, you know, it's really hard to self-assess these things. Yeah, there are a couple of tools like things like Strengths Finder yep. um, that are pretty widely used and helpful. Um, there's another one called Fascinate that I like. There's one called uh, the Via the Values and Action tool. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more of what you value, not necessarily what your skills are, but I think that's also a really important question. Mm -hmm. So there are some tools that are that you know widely available. Um, easy to access that come with with books explaining the findings. I also think it's really helpful. This is a good question to have a mentor or to have a mastermind because the way that people see you is often different than the way that you see yourself. And sometimes people can call out strengths in you that you are not necessarily terribly aware of. Mm -hmm. So those are those are great conversations to have with your significant other, with your co-founder, with people on your team because they can provide some interesting feedback. Yeah, definitely. And I think something a lot of founders that I've come across struggle with is is working in the business instead of on the business and feeling like they need to be across absolutely everything and the whole, you know, if you want something done well, you've got to do it yourself. And obviously, that's got a ceiling on it, right? If you were oh, yeah. trying to do everything, then you're only going to go so far. 
Yeah, and you just can't be good at everything. I mean, that's that's part of this strength based conversation yeah. is you just can't be good at everything. Mm-hmm. And you have to pick your sweet spots and double down on what you're good at and what's most important to you. And then also acknowledge that other people are really good at other things. And to be able to access great partners or to access um, people that you can outsource key parts of your business to um, can be a great way for your business to be excellent because you have a team of excellence instead of you being mediocre at 75% of things and awesome at 25% of things. Yeah. And this ties into something else I wanted to explore, which was overwhelm and having lots of different things on your plate as an entrepreneur. But if you are more conscious of what your strengths are and therefore you do more delegating, does this then mean that you will also be less likely to become overwhelmed because you haven't got so many disparate things going on where you've got that cognitive switching always happening between totally different types of tasks? Yeah, I think the more that you can preserve cognitive functioning, the better. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, you know, to be honest, so when I think about personality structure, I am really high on a personality component called openness to experience, which means that I love novelty and I can move around quickly and move between things quickly. So last week I was in London giving a a talk to a tech conference. This week I'm home. I'm attending some trainings. I'm uh, seeing clients. And then next week I'm in Nicaragua giving a, a training on trauma. So, you know, that sort of moving about between different conversations really stimulates me. That gets me going. But that's, you know, that's highly a personality thing. My husband, on the other hand, is sort of this classic engineer. And he's like, I want to think about one thing and I want to do that thing to completion. And and I don't want to shift until, you know, that thing is finished. So again, understanding how you work, knowing how you work and preserving the energy that you have and being really a good steward of your most valuable asset, which is your intelligence, your creativity, your energy, your effort, your time, protecting that well um, is is a great investment. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. So I find that, you know, there's a lot of narrative and literature out there around, you know, just focus on the one thing. Don't spread yourself too thin across a lot of different areas. You know, if you want to be successful, you just got to go deep on the one area. But um, I'm a bit like you in the sense that I host the podcast, I'm writing this book, I work with startups, there's a lot of different things going on, but that gives me energy, um, whereas if I was to just focus on the one, one thing every single day, I'd probably get bored after a while versus switching and having that variety and novelty in your life. Yep. And again, I think there's there's wisdom in figuring out how to apply that because you still have a capacity for deep work. You're still conscious of whatever I'm doing. I'm going to stay focused on that one thing. I'm not trying to multitask every minute of my life, but that there are a range of conversations that you can meaningfully be engaged in in a, in a week or in a month um, without without feeling sort of drained or tired or overwhelmed. Yeah, definitely. Couldn't agree more. And um I guess I wanted to wrap up just on some um, tools or techniques that entrepreneurs can use to become more productive. I mean, some things I see all the time when I'm walking past someone's desk is a little notification pops up in the top right corner of the screen. And I'm like, dude, you've got to turn those notifications off. Like they're just going to completely pull you out of what you're doing. They're going to destroy your ability to get into the flow. Um, I mean, but what are some other sort of common pitfalls um, you see when it comes to entrepreneurs and the way they manage their their time? Yeah, I think, you know, especially when we think about keeping relationships healthy, mm-hmm. one thing that can be super helpful is, is putting your phone away for at least a couple hours yeah. in the evening. Yeah. I mean, so few of us are dealing with situations that are truly emergencies that it is okay to – Go kick the ball with your kids or have a conversation with your significant other without having your phone in the room. And I do think that those phones are – they're great tools, but they are incredibly distracting, not just for our work life but for our personal lives. And giving ourselves some freedom from the phone is a great practice. Um, Another thing that I found to be really helpful in my life, both personally and professionally, is taking a regular retreat. Mm -hmm. where I go away by myself for a couple of days and spend some time doing a deep dive on the the big picture parts of my life. What's satisfying? Am I happy? What are my goals? And again, that's 
not checking email. It's not doing the hacking away at the to-do list. I, I put my phone away except for emergencies. So I think um, giving yourself big chunks of time to do deeper existential questions is something that can sustain you through six months or through 12 months of work because you you have a deep sense of what it is you're doing and why. Um, so I think that that's a really helpful tool as well. Yeah, and I think that deep sense of what you're doing and why, I mean, purpose ultimately is the world's number one performance enhancer, right? There's supplements, there's all this stuff out there, nootropics, you name it, but unless you understand why you're doing something, you're not really going to show up and bring 100%, at least not for a prolonged period of time. And, you know, I do something similar every uh, three months where I basically draw up a canvas, start doing, stop doing, do more, do less. And I just bring that back to that underlying why and is this stuff serving me? If not, I need to be intentional about, okay, this is not serving you. Let's just stop doing that. Um, we're, because as human beings and with so much going on around us, you know, the phones, technology, marketing messages, you name it, it's so easy to just get sucked into the process of going through the motions and just doing, 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 doing. Before you know it, you wake up one day, it's 30 years later and it's like, hmm, what have I actually been moving towards or <laughs> spending my time on all these years? And I, I think one of the metrics to help us answer those questions is not only about what we're doing, but how we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's, you know, kind of a touchy feely message in some ways, but really paying attention to your emotional life. Yeah. What are the parts of your work day that really spark joy or curiosity that you seem to come alive doing? And what are the parts of your work day or of your life where you just feel like it's drudgery and it's effortful and it's tiring? Of course, most of us can't fully eliminate all of the hard things from our lives. I mean, I know I spend a lot of time like making school lunches and folding people's socks and like <laughs> taking care of people. And that, that's not always super joyful and exciting. Yeah. But but when we listen to how we feel, we get really important data about where the sweet spots of our life are. And that can sometimes help answer those questions on your on your canvas is what do, what do I do more of? Do, mm. do more of the things that bring life to you. But if you're not paying attention to how you're feeling on the day to day, then it might be quite difficult for you to, to sort of randomly generate how to answer those questions. Yeah. And I think one thing that has worked really well for me and something that I advise a lot of entrepreneurs I work with is to do more of the stuff you actually enjoy. Just outsource the stuff you don't or automate it. I mean, today using say virtual um, assistance. It doesn't cost a hell of a lot of money to get someone else to do all the administrative, laborious stuff, which just saps you of your energy and doesn't leave you feeling all that fulfilled afterwards. So if you can get rid of that stuff, give yourself more time for the stuff you enjoy, then it's that positive feedback loop that over time will just mean you're more focused and you've got this sustained effort going towards whatever you're working on. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Sherry, you've been an awesome guest, but I can't let you go without throwing you into our three-question lightning round. You ready to rock Ooh, and roll? Sure. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, question number one is, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, so this could be you know, Ford in 1903, who would it be and at what stage? Oh, shoot. Um, okay. You know what? This is the first thing that popped into mind, so I'll just say it. I, I would work for the UN High Commission for Refugees. Okay. And that's that's that? a problem I care about. Yeah, fantastic. That's a problem I care about. Perfect. Great answer. Um, question number two. If you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? I would ask Audrey Hepburn about fashion advice. Because <laughs> <laughs> clearly my first answer was so deep and <laughs> that's awesome you kind of like balance the scales right, I gotta somewhere. balance it out I gotta balance it out <laughs> awesome and I feel like this last question is kind of redundant but I'm gonna ask it anyway because what I ask my guests is what rituals or routines do you have to stay on top of your game and we've kind of touched on a few today but is there anything else you do to just keep doing the kind of work you do Sherry I practice aerial yoga. Oh, cool. Which is like yoga suspended from a hammock. So yep. you're, you're off the ground, mm -hmm. um, which is super helpful for focus and attention and uh, all kinds of cognitive skills as well as being fun and sort of risky. And it, it crosses off a lot of boxes for me that I think help fuel my work. Yeah. And stuff like that, that kind of puts you into flow and makes the rest of the world fade away for a moment, just leaves you feeling recharged afterwards, I find. 
Yeah, and if you're distracted, you'll fall on your head. So you you, got to be all in. (laughs) Love it, love it. Well, people can obviously find the book over on Amazon and anywhere good books are sold. Um, They can check out the podcast, Zen Founder at zenfounder.com, Apple Podcast Teacher, you name it, wherever you find your podcast, and they can follow you on Twitter at Zen Founder. Is there anywhere else they should go to um, connect with you and find out more about your work? Yeah, that is pretty much where I live, Zen Founder (laughs) on the internet in different mechanisms. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. You've been an awesome guest and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Steve. Cheers. I appreciate it. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, eBooks, and more that we're publishing on a regular basis, just head over to futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll get the very next one.